Now, moving on to our next topic is how do we, what are the determinants for patients who are inadequately controlled or intolerant? And one of the rare ones that I've seen are patients who start hydroxyurea and, and have just this explosion of squamous cell carcinomas, and the dermatologist is just chasing them. But, but there are other very specific determinants that we should talk about. Uh, Ruben, do you want to uh, tackle that for us? Sure. No, uh, I mean, w w without question, you know, just chiming in on the hydroxyurea piece. I, I, think, it, I think it's an important one and, and largely unrecognized, you know, I think by most treating clinicians. You know, hydroxyurea is a very helpful therapy, but it's a particularly tough on the mucocutaneous areas. You know, so as we think about resistance or intolerance, it's two different groups. So let's start with the intolerant piece. What is intolerance? Certainly there is that secondary malignancy piece of which can, uh, skin is certainly the most common. Even this week uh, was looped in on a case that had metastatic Merkel cell carcinoma with uh, a long history of hydroxyurea use. So th that's clearly one. But I think a lot more of the subtle mucocutaneous reasons for intolerance for hydroxyurea are very relevant. Uh, ulcers on the mouth, uh, ulcers on the legs. Uh, and that's one of those toxicities. If you're looking for it, it's very obvious when it occurs, but in those that uh, really have a much rarer interaction with hydroxyurea, I'll see patients who, again, come in with one or two legs bandaged up with their malleolar ulcers that, again, are having all this extensive vascular workup, uh, and it's really hydroxyurea related. You know, other common ones with hydroxyurea can be fevers, uh, can be GI side effect, there can be some alopecia. Again, none of these are common, but, but they certainly can uh, occur, uh, GI side effects. Uh, and there's even individuals that have very rare cycling of their counts, kind of a, a strange almost stem cell sort of phenomenon where the platelets will both rise and fall and it's very, very difficult to, to dose adjust. So many ways to be really uh, intolerant. Uh, I think a separate issue that we can discuss uh, as we go along is really just failing to meet the goals of therapy with hydroxyurea, but all of those are areas of intolerance. Now, what about resistance? Now, resistance depends on how you define the goals. Uh, our current ELN response criteria for treating polycythemia vera, again, looks at improvement in counts, but it also looks at improvement in symptoms and improvement in splenomegaly. Now, improvement in counts, you know, it is rare the individual that if you give a high enough dose of hydroxyurea that their blood counts will not fall. Now, they may not be tolerant of that dose. We put someone on six grams of hydroxyurea a day, their counts will fall. I mean, they'll probably become aplastic. They won't tolerate it. So I find that the resistance part uh, is less about uh, cytoreduction, but is it about tolerable cytoreduction? Where I find individuals really fail the efficacy challenge with hydroxyurea is regarding any enlargement of the spleen, difficult symptoms, uh, and clearly that tolerability issue. Right. Yeah, I think partly also the, the, the dose defi definition of a resistance is based on what you are saying, Some, like, you know, which is suggested to be three grams if you are needing more than three grams. Because like in my experience, once you start pushing above that dose is where you run into side effects, the mucocutaneous side effects, the other things that the patient, not just the cytopenias, the risk of the other side effects increases. So it's probably the resistance is tied to the tolerability of the treatment. So. Well, remember, in ELN guidelines, it's not just the dose of hydroxyurea. Right. I mean, maximally tolerated dose or um, up to, I think it's two grams a day, Six. but it's for three months. Right. You know, you can't just give a patient a prescription and say they're resistant if they don't respond the next day. Um, yeah, it's, okay. it's truly, you know, as I share with patients, it is a chronic disease. So as we ET, PV, and myelofibrosis, Myelofibrosis are clearly our appropriate times that we treat it in a much more acute sort of setting. But polycythemia vera is really about trying to make the disease as invisible in the patient's life as possible. You know, how do you control the disease in a way that has them feel as normally as possible with the least amount of toxicity? So, so again, it, you know, does it have to be tolerable? You know, I, I share with patients, again, hydroxyurea as a long-acting drug that patients, almost all patients, typically fall between 10 to 20 pills of hydroxyurea a week. They're the rare individuals that get by with one a day. They're, they're not common. Uh, but individuals, as soon as you start going north of 1,500 milligrams of hydroxyurea a day, that's a pretty rare individual. 
that either requires, needs, or tolerates doses above there. So if I see someone who's on two grams a day for an extended period of time, they, they, they're an outlier. And then there's hematologic intolerance, which is kind of lumped in with resistance sometimes, but it's really intolerance where in order to shrink the spleen with hydrea, you can't give a dose that doesn't cause neutropenia or sure, or, or even anemia. So all of those have to be con considered.